Good morning, everyone. I'm here in the UK, so it may very well be your evening where you are, just as it is for Dr. Robin. Hi, Dr. Robin. Hi, Chelsea. <laughs> <laughs> and today we are here to talk about nipple shields for breastfeeding. Now, this is becoming a really common quick fix, shall we call it, for a lot of women around the world. It seems to be um, becoming more and more common that many professionals are handing out or recommending nipple shields in the situation where a woman may be experiencing challenges, complex challenges, or perhaps they have um, inverted or flat nipples. So Dr. Robin, would you like to start by talking about your experiences early on with the nipple shield or the nipple guard, some people may call it? Okay, so um, early on, but I'm talk I'd like to open up with it started, these were designed in the 1980s to collect samples of milk. So they'd put a tube behind it, collect the sample of milk to measure the fat in the maternal milk. And then they became an item. And uh, so my early experience with these were they were causing problems. So then I, the being the person I am, I want to know why, uh, having done my research uh, over six and a half years and all the data, I began to learn why they were a problem. And then observing mothers and babies using them, I could see and you can observe, you know, the consequences of using a nipple shield on a baby that you're wanting to breastfeed. And I'm sure a lot of the mothers will support that too, because it's hard to return to breastfeeding after they've had a, a nipple shield, a silicone nipple shield in their mouth, which was never designed for uh, covering the nipple, the beautiful erectile tissue of the nipple, never designed for that. So, you know, it's, it's a learning curve that we all go on, not just me, but... I'm the person that likes to have the answers so <laughs> yeah and I thank goodness for that and I think that it's I think this is a good time for us to say that we do we do see women every single day um, who have intended to breastfeed who were recommended or um, suggested the use of a nipple shield nipple guard and have gone through the quite challenging sometimes very challenging process of tra transitioning from the shield to the breast. And a lot of women share about the inconvenience of a shield as well. That's aside from all of the other challenges that come along with it, um, which I know you're going to get into in more detail in a minute. But um, th the fact that you have to take this with you wherever you go. So if you don't intend to um, introduce a bottle or another oral device whilst you're out and about, many women have experienced difficulty with with getting baby and nipple shield on at the same time. You know, breastfeeding and, and a new baby can be can be fun <laughs> as it is. So introducing something that's that's an additional thing to consider can, can make it really, really challenging. And that's what we see and hear about every day. So like you just said, Dr. Robin, it started and has continued to be a marketed product, a product that is not necessarily needed for breastfeeding. And we prefer, and you prefer, to work with the woman to introduce, um, introduce the education during pregnancy. You sometimes say during to the teenage years and during the whole hormonal changes so that you can work with women that perhaps have inverted or flat nipples which is I think the most common reason they're introduced yeah and, and there may be a it's, it's quite commonly a family history of it too so when a little baby girl is born you'll see for some of them that they already have an inverted nipple from birth and then that continues on through the years and it depends how the mother chooses with the, the most gentle advice we can give her in handling that very erectile tissue, how she would like to evert the nipple. And that's really important too, because I've had some pretty horror stories of those sort of things as well. So I'm not going to go into those, of course, because uh, it's, it's, and it's really unreasonable that these things happen to women. Mm, absolutely. And that is something we do have to sometimes discuss as well, because we do see like you said, some horrific things and hear some horrific yeah. stories. And the stories from the women. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, like you say, <laughs> we can't get into that today, but no. that is that is the baseline, isn't it? Of the Thompson Method is yeah. you asking right. why this is happening and seeing these 
horrific things happening around you and also observing some really beautiful things happening around you and how there's such a difference when there's not as much or not any intervention and when the mother is able to just be guided by her instincts that's what you've been able to see and and that's the the, the foundation of the Thompson method and yeah. and why we actually introduced um Chelsea uh soon after the baby's born mm. so there's it's very difficult to for a mother to deal with a, a nipple shield and a newborn baby uh, again I'm not sure I would need to be present and see how that would be suitable for her if she hasn't had the prenatal advice and experience of of how to deal with that herself mm. you know um, again I I can't answer all any questions that would come up to because every mother and every baby's unique every inverted nipple is unique Absolutely. And, and that's the key isn't it would you agree the key is to accessing this education during pregnancy hopefully even earlier but but ultimately during pregnancy so that, that these women can be prepared and, and actually have the confidence to navigate and advocate for themselves and make informed decisions um and when, it's better for them because if they they know their uniqueness no one else knows their uniqueness so absolutely. it's better for them to to deal with it too yeah Absolutely. Well, we do uh, every day. We see, um, like we said, we see women who have been suggested or recommended to use nipple shields. Some of them, because they've been through the online education, are able to say no or navigate themselves around and make an informed decision. But sometimes we do see women that have they have begun the journey of using nipple shields and now they're reaching out for um, guidance or help and support um, to transition off of the nipple shield and back to the breast. Now, we have seen a variety of reasons why women are recommended the nipple shield. I was recommended the nipple shield for my first um, child, my son, back in 2020. We were in lockdown. We couldn't access any um, local help. I hadn't discovered the wonderful Dr. Robin or the Thompson Method yet. And I was in absolute agony. I was trying a thousand different positions. Um, and, and a quick fix was um, the midwife uh, recommended a nipple shield. It was the weekend and she said, go out, buy a nipple shield. And the first time I tried it, it was horrific. The nipple trauma was way worse. And after a few hours, I ditched it. And, and thankfully that weekend is when I, when I found you guys and learned more about baby's oral cavity and all the other wonderful things that you in include in the program. So... In your experience, Dr. Robin, what are some of the most common reasons that the nipple shield are is introduced to, to mums with new babies? Um, I think one of the problems is the sleepy baby syndrome. Uh, when the babies of mothers have had opiates in labour, epidurals, spinals, uh, general anaesthetics, the sleepy baby syndrome, the baby can't actually use its oral cavity to full potential to feed. That would be one. Um, I think it's also to do with uh, someone else looking at your nipple and saying, oh, that's too small or that's too flat or, you know, again, uh, is someone sitting with you quietly and observing a feed and talking you through the, those things? Um, uh, and the reasons for it too are that uh, I don't, well, one of the common things is that people who do recommend it don't actually see the outcomes, right? So the woman goes home with the nipple shield and then the com complications start. And so it might be on the short term, you know, the way to bring the baby to you, but it changes the whole oral cavity function. Mm -hmm. What a good and point. And, on that, when, and also the other common thing that I see is the poor little baby's trying to use its oral cavity to vacuum and then the nipples protruding through the holes at the other end and the mother's in agony. So again, I, I'm, you know, there's a whole lot of variations to all of these things, as you know, and and uh, the stories that the mothers tell me and how they're they're insulted with their breasts and their nipples by the language that's used. They're not deliberately insulted, but it's the language that's applied yeah, to it. Sure. And then that yeah. that seed of doubt is planted, yeah. and then and it then, goes downhill, doesn't it? That's right. And then when, when they come to wanting to transition to breastfeeding, the baby struggles with the soft, pliable, beautiful breast tissue that actually moulds to fit the unique oral cavity, whereas the silicone, silicone can't do that. Mm. And, of course, it, it 
the baby can't vacuum properly. So therefore the milk production is changed sometimes too because the baby's not using the breast, the mother's breast to full potential either to stimulate the hormones. So there's a whole range of little things that go on with each unique mother's story and her history, her family history, um, and and more recently uh, some of the horrific ways that some professionals um, are actually everting their nipple via means that I would never, yeah. ever <clears throat> consider, and it's barbaric. So And it's very painful and it's actually very traumatic. Well, it's way right out of range. range of what you do with it with sensitive, sensitive. It's erectile tissue and it's the so sensitive you don't do those things. And I've had a recent story and I won't repeat that here because it'll scare everybody off, but it's... <laughs> it's and these beautiful women are telling their stories and they are recorded so it's not me being obstructive about it or you know it's about telling the truth absolutely and and thank goodness that that us women have the avenue the safe community to do that because it seems mm. as though as this obstetric violence this um this very rough approach to breastfeeding is on the increase it seems to become it's becoming more of the norm I think so there's less space and awareness around sharing these stories which is a real shame so so you've just mentioned and touched upon there some of the risks in using a nipple shield I just want to highlight I just remembered one of the lovely stories from our members who worked with you um I do believe um she had had a baby that was rushed away from her she had a a low at gas score um in the hospital um the baby was introduced to bottle without her permission um so she really struggled with getting baby to the breast um, had spent a few days in hospital so um she decided um using her own instincts to introduce a nipple shield just to get baby comfortable at the breast yeah. and you worked with her to gently transition baby um off the shield to the breast so i guess that is a nice transition isn't it that that is um, from bottle to shield to breast, um, a lot of challenges, a lot of hard work on her on her part and working closely with yourself, she was able to overcome that. And, and, what a and it's unique for her. I, I, I wouldn't like everybody to think it's the same for everybody because it's not. It's unique to, to her and her situation. Her Every person on the planet, you might have heard me say this a thousand times, is unique. And every mother and baby, they are unique. And if we can look at their uniqueness and take that into consideration, their breasts, their nipple, their arms, their body shape, you know, all of that makes a difference. Their wellness, how how they're feeling, all of those things make the difference to how um, you can help that mother overcome the situation she's in. And, you know, it's not 100% all the time, but it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty good. The statistics are coming up pretty good I I don't have any uh, analysis of my data yet but I'm hoping it's going to happen (laughs) we hope you get the time to do that soon that's for sure you're very busy Um, but that's that's a very good point and the funding it takes a lot to (laughs) the list list goes on funding is yeah Um, of course that's um, the ultimate isn't it that's right yeah but I think I think what you said there is so important. You, you speak about every woman being unique and having to observe the breast. But really what we want to do, we want to connect with women during pregnancy so that they can avoid these common complications. Yeah. I know that I would have avoided like I have with my second baby. That's proof. The proof is in the pudding. I have avoided any of those common complications and I've shocked every midwife or specialist that I've seen with how well we're doing breastfeeding, four months now exclusively breastfeeding, thanks to the education and knowledge that I didn't have with Jacob the first time round, women can avoid these. And I think the absolute key is being prepared for the unexpected. If baby is separated from you, you should have, and you will be able to have the knowledge and have a plan in place on what to do if that was to happen so that breastfeeding is still supported and and that you can have baby breastfeeding when the time is right and you do beautifully support and educate us on on that very very special topic of being separated as well and not being able to achieve those three golden hours so yeah if you want to learn more if you want to hear Dr. Robin go into, as I said, beautiful detail on that specific topic and nipple shields and bottle feeding and and so many other topics and be fully prepared for breastfeeding. 
do please connect with us and we will we will answer any questions or share some more details with you. Now, like Dr. Robin just said, we do prefer to work closely with women and guide them um, through any challenges um, you or they may be experiencing, um, usually by applying some of the key principles of the Thompson Method, um, working one to one with one of our practitioners um, and observing a feed, like Dr. Robin said, um, that 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 is when a rescue may be better suited. Um, like I said, reach out and we can point you in the right direction. And yeah, I think Dr. Robin, would you like to would you like to share um, maybe an experience yourself um, when you first saw a nipper shield and and what your thoughts were? Um, I, I, I don't think I thought too much about it at first. I think the the knowledge came with watching what was happening with the women and and you know it was slipping away it was moving it baby wasn't able to to do all the things it needed to do but uh we didn't have that in our prenatal preparation uh, as midwives either so i think you know there's an issue there as well we the the understanding how the oral cavity function works is so important and 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 how they the, our body is so brilliant in the way it wants to survive from the tiny minute even in utero the babies are drinking and drinking and hiccuping every time they drink they hiccup so they're wanting to survive and and so when it comes to birth and breastfeeding uh, it's time we need to spend with women quiet gentle time where the baby is with the mother with an APGAR score of seven or more and where the baby's locating the breast with the mother and they're doing it together and the baby knows exactly what to do if it's not affected by opioids and uh, and they actually find their way to the breast and so many times that happened so many times did I visit homes and see women with inverted nipples we worked around that. I saw um, several women who had in, inverted nipples. The baby would invert them, drink, and then it would invert again. And, you know, they're things that we didn't, I didn't see in my education mm. in, in midwifery. I learned that from beautiful women all along the way and then asking the questions that were running around in my head like a merry-go-round, you know, well, what is it? And then finding out that, the nipple shield was never, and reading about it was never meant for breastfeeding. It was always for, or the nipple guard, as you call it. Um, it was meant for collecting milk samples in in the eighties when they were measuring fat content in the maternal milk. And that's that's just mind blowing for me. Something that's now yeah. um, making a lot of journeys quite difficult was never intended for that purpose in the first place, which no. which explains a lot, really, doesn't it? Yeah. And, uh, and, yeah, and so they don't, don't make individual nipple shields for individual unique nipples and breasts either. Exactly. So it's a one size fits all, which is not mm. the way it works. No, no, for sure. And you will never be able to replicate the soft, pellable tissue, like you said, with something that is a silicone oral device. So, yeah, yeah we hope. Well, I mean, we have we've touched upon all of the questions that we've been sent in. Um, and the common questions that are asked quite regularly. The last one that is you have already mentioned, but just quickly, um, can it lower and impact our breast milk volume? Yes, in, I have seen that because when the baby is not being able to draw the nipple and stimulate the breast in the way that the, that the baby does, where it's the nipples back in the soft palatal cleft and the rest of the breast tissue moulds, then when the baby's stimulating, it's stimulating hormone production and then it's swallowing when the milk comes down. If the baby's not able to do that, it can slow down milk, milk production. It depends where um, and how long, where in the cycle it was introduced, how long it's been used for and how the baby's now converted the intraoral cavity function to the nipple shield mm. and it's imprinted in the brain. So that imprint in the brain then, you know, changes what the baby does to stimulate the maternal breast. Um, and if we, if the, if the stimulation is not appropriate for that mother, then her milk volume can reduce. That's how maternal milk is made by stimulation to increase hormone levels to release that into the maternal bloodstream and then through the maternal milk so that it produces the maternal milk, the 
the um, hormones, prolactin and oxytocin. So oh, right. if we if we miss out on all that valuable part, now there might be times when a mother needs, you know, really help in a way that's going to benefit her initially, but that's unique again to to what the situation is. Um, do we really need to use this? Have we just used it on an offhand? Um, oh, yes, use a nipple shield, or are we really sitting down and watching what's happening? Are we not touching the baby? We don't need to touch a mother's baby. As soon as we start touching the baby, we interfere with that beautiful connection that they need from birth, from the moment of birth. And, and you know, if you look at other mammals on the planet, they won't let you touch their baby, not unless they're in the zoo. Oh, yes, absolutely. And that actually is a lot of food for thought, I think, yeah. because it makes you view it makes you view things in a different perspective. So maybe if you are, we do see it, have been recommended nipple shield during pregnancy before you've even been given the chance to breastfeed. That's please, true. please yeah. do reach out because, you know, like Dr. Robert just said, uh, mammals are inherently um, ready to breastfeed. So if you feel like it won't be possible for you, it, it is very unique. So do reach out and, and we will connect with you and signpost you. To the yeah, most and, and all oral devices change. All silicone oral devices change the oral function. And, and I've been working with thousands of mothers and babies. So I've observed this time and time again. There you go. Absolutely. So we hope you found today's informative session helpful. Um, we obviously would love to continue chatting about it. There's so much to be said and, and there is a lot more um, information on the on, in the online education. So just, just reach out, let us know. And if you found today's session helpful, please do like and share this video so that we can reach as many women and families as possible around the world so that we can really support um, women during pregnancy and, and this movement as it continues to grow and the community as it continues con to grow can help and, and support as many women as possible. So thank you so much for watching and Dr. Robin, as always, thank you for your time and your expertise. Thank you, Chelsea. Thanks, guys. We will be back next week. I will be back next week to speak with a lovely lady um, from our community who's going to share her breastfeeding journey using the Thompson method. So I look forward to that. Take care, guys. Thanks again.